So the first uh, presentation is by Aaron Levin, and he's going to talk about dual booting. Yeah, okay, so um, I'm gonna make this very fast because I have to go look at the couch, but then I'll be back to join you all for drinks and dinner later. But, um, so uh, my name's Aaron, I have, uh, you can read this, but um, I, I'm living here from Canada now. Um, what I want to talk about was the state of, in, of dual booting a, a, a brand new uh, MacBook Pro with uh, NixOS. So right now this MacBook, uh, you don't have to believe me because all you see is a browser, but it's running NixOS. I guess I can do like uname dash a, so it has uh, Nix on there. So I guess you couldn't, I don't have to believe me for that either. But yeah, so I want to talk about that and, and what some of the issues are. And uh, there is one major bug that may or may not be a kernel bug, and uh, I will show it to you. And then also I have a promise that if any of you wants to try to fix it, I will donate 50 euro to the uh, NixOS Foundation. And I'm like a very uh, cash conscious person, so that's like in my mind like thousands of dollars. Okay, but uh, because I'm consider my, oh my God, that's not what I want at all. Ah, okay. So, um, but I also have a meta presentation, which is a new presentation technique that I invented called tab driven presentations. Um, so, <laughs> It's really good. I'm doing it right now. I made my presentation two seconds ago. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm a thought leader. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the level of support in the Nix community. This is a issue I had when I was installing um, uh, Mac OS. I don't know what I'm doing um, in the world of computers. And so I had this big issue where I just cut and pasted as much as I could. And then th these really kind people just wouldn't leave me alone and they kept helping me. And then I was like up like so late. <laughs> and uh, you know, let's see what happens. There's no luck. I, it was like four in the morning. Um, I wish there was some kind of wait, like it just goes on, I, sorry. Um, just really goes on and on and on that they were helping me with this issue. And um, the, the good thing is, is it has, an, see there's a green light here, so it had a good Ending. So I just want to commend the NixOS community for being so supportive. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, so what is the, the, the current um, State of the Union? If you want to dual boot a Mac OS with uh, Nix, you can do it. It will work. Um, and it's a fine system and you get the good hardware and you can look really cool in the cafes. But um, uh, there is one really big problem, and that's there's this uh, nasty bug here that says unreliable suspend and wait on the MacBook Pro. This says 12.1, uh, but it, if you scroll and scroll and scroll, almost as much scrolling as my NixOS support, um, you will find many people are having this problem. And so I, I promised I would demo the problem. This is an, a different screen, but also on the same computer. And if I close this, it probably actually might not break because of this business. And um, so then you go into your work meeting and the, your boss is showing me the new deployment system on Nix OS and you open it and uh, nothing will show up. Um, and so you will panic because your boss is now thinking twice about all the new deployment setup you have. And then it'll start getting really hot. So now you're like sweating in the room with your boss because the computer's overheating. And um, eventually it'll shut down, which is good. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you'll reboot and your system will be back up again. But uh, uh, I mean, you don't want that. So that's the, the current state. Um, and if anybody really wants to like uh, dig very deep into this bug, I will lend this um, computer and we can hack away at it and try to figure it out. Um, and, uh, and I will also commit to sharing the learnings of how we debugged it online um, as well. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, you can install it. It will work. The suspend resume bug uh, remains. And uh, thank, for the, thank Nick's OS community for the great support. And that is the end of my talk. I won't be offended if you don't ask questions, so don't feel that you need to, but I will like leave this room and feel sad. <laughs> I'm, I'm only kidding.
Yeah, help. So the, this bug, uh, the screen does turn off, but uh, the system works. Uh, it, well, it's difficult. It it's uh, so I tried to like cat uh, two files and mash buttons and do as much as I could to figure it out. It's it. If you look at the the logs, um, system D registers asleep, but it doesn't register awake. Um, but when I open the the screen. Um, like something's running, but like a, a few things I noticed is like I have one of these keys that the security people at SoundCloud made me use, Ubix or something. I'm not a security person, uh, but uh, the light won't like the USB uh, is no longer gets detected anymore. So like it'll be it'll detect it when it's shut or something, but I open it and then it shuts off. So I. It's much beyond my understanding so of systems. So. Likely something else, but sometimes I I get similar. I don't have a MacBook, but uh, it I don't get the screen is black, and if I switch to virtual terminals and back to AX, then it it gets back. But yeah. otherwise, I'm unable to work around it. Yeah, Ma uh, yeah. You it, it it straight up is like a, a brick. And Mac MacBooks have this really nice feature that. Um, these mouse pads have haptic feedback, and so you really know when your machine turns off because you can't press the buttons anymore, um, which is good for debugging a black screen. Um, <laughs> I mean, like it was like literally, I would be like, "Is this thing even on? Like, I can't hear anything." And then like people are partying out because I'm doing it at Berghain all the time, so I can't hear anything. And uh, the haptic feedback trick was uh, very helpful for figuring out what was happening. Okay, thank you. Next up is going to be Matthias Bayer, who is going to talk about uh, a collection of tools he's built called Nix Scripts. Hi. Um, so when I started with uh, NixOS, I had uh, this one problem. I, I added my configuration.nix and uh, um, re-edited it and rebuilt the system and it worked and then I want to go on and edit it again and again and again. And um, no, I don't have, don't have a device. <laughs> uh, I don't have things to show. Um, so and I, I wanted to have uh, the possibility to go back in my configuration.nix um, to a point where my system uh, builds, but I uh, wasn't able to find it in the Git reverse uh, in the Git history because there were so many comments. So I started to write a script which um, um, generates a, a tag in my repository every time my system rebuilds. So um, um, this was the first step, and then I continued writing scripts and scripts, and I put them together into a collection of scripts. Um, and there are tools available for um, updating uh, package definitions in a Nix package repository by pulling the patch from the monitor.nixos.org uh, tool, um, applying the patch, trying to build a package, and if it works, push it to GitHub, and I just have to p uh, push the uh, pull request button and everything uh, is fine, and I have exactly one step in my command line to update a package. Um, I added um, other tools to update my channels in one step, so I can update my channels, and uh, if I can rebuild my system with this channel, I can go into my configuration.nix uh, repository, uh, and I see I built generation 42 uh, from this commit and from this channel at that time, so I can go into my configuration. Um, set my channel generation to this specific point and rebuild the system exactly how it was with this one configuration dot nix. Um, yeah, and there are some other tools available, and you can find uh, all the scripts on GitHub and Matthias Bayer slash nix has my uh, dash scripts. Um, yeah, and suggestions are welcome. So that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Can you uh, stay for uh, one question or two, uh, one yep. reaction or two? Jan? Hey, I suggest you tweet the link, because yeah. your name is difficult to spell for some people. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I can... Uh, we, know you, we know you from mail, 
Yeah, I can put it on IRC or mailing list or whatever. Yep. Okay, very practical suggestion, very good. Next, uh, next question. Um, I went to your scripts because I wanted to do a difference between my two generations and just remember what's the change between generation two and three, for example. And I also made a pull request to your repo, so uh -huh. you saw that. But we are very limited in, yeah, we cannot do difference between generations because most of the information is lost. So we do not know what are the difference between the next scripts that were used to generate the two generations. You know what I mean? So Not really, no. If you compare two generations, you can, you can see what are the different, the different packages that have been installed, and you can look at the different hashes. So if there is a package with the same name, but a different hash, you can assume that there was a change somewhere. But it's very difficult to know the root of the change. Okay. So, I don't know, maybe you should talk about that, or yeah. if someone has an idea of how can we retrieve the difference between the two Nix expressions that were used to generate the two different systems. That would be interesting. Okay, um, you really should talk. <laughs> One more question? <coughs> Uh, have you thought about contributing any of this back to Nix itself? I'm wondering if maybe there's like, you could have a hooks system or something in Nix that would maybe hook into your scripts that rather than having to call your scripts directly. Would be a nice idea, yes. Um, I think the, the purpose of Nix and, and my scripts are not really the same. Nix is like, uh, for me, as an end user, package management and so on, and my scripts are like the surrounding parts. But yeah, would be a nice idea, yes. One more? Time for one more? I can show you in GitHub. Not really a question, just wanted to report that I'm a very happy user and I wanted to say thank you for writing it. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, so while we are setting up the laptop, I'll introduce the third uh, Lightning, which is going to be by Emery Hemingway, who will be talking about what happens when you point Nix to Gnode. So I don't know what Gnode is, so I'm really curious about okay. what he's going to say. Okay. Um, hopefully it works. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I've been spending the last few months porting Nix to Gnode, um, which is a microkernel operating system. Um, it, this is all experimental and requires features that aren't in the master Gnode branch, so it's not really reproducible right now. Um, uh, the goals for the port were I had to do everything natively. I didn't want to sort of do, do Unix emulation. I didn't want to like just sort of try and fix system calls. Um, <coughs> I want it to be pure, at least as pure as the Unix implementation. It's actually more pure, and I'll get to that. Um, I have to have a lockless store because our file system doesn't have uh, locks. Um, no database either. Um, that's something that may not work long term, but um, and it has to be invisible to uh, applications, and that does work. And I want it to be recursive, but that's that's theoretical, and I don't see why it shouldn't be, but. That's not known. Um, so just, I gotta talk about Unix first. Uh, it's really old. It's only made for development. It it's, has a file system as an uh, intrinsic feature. It's provided by the kernel. The file system's everywhere. Uh, it's for multiple users. Policy is administrated by the root. Um, and you have users and groups. Gino, on the other hand, is released outside of the university at Dresden in 2008. 
Uh, it's designed to be low complexity, high security, which makes things kind of complicated, even though it says low complexity. Um, it's kernel agnostic, so it runs on microkernels, separation kernels, and monolithic kernels, and I'm running a L4 family hypervisor right now. Um, and <clears throat> if, if it's going to count for anything, we have to have legacy software support. So we have a libc, uh, we have SDL, QT, um, and we have VirtualBox running. So what we don't support natively, you can virtualize. Um, we have distributed policy. This is, we don't have a root user. So um, you, can, you can subdivide the system and then make meaningful policy decisions at different points. Um, and then we have different services, and all the services are addressed by capabilities. And we have, you know, we can share memory using capabilities and threads and stuff like this. Um, but the file system is optional, and that's where it gets tricky. Um, so <clears throat> everything in GNOTE is done with the parent-child relationship. Um, like, and then you have services routed between these components. Sometimes it crosses this parent-child barrier. And I said low complexity, and this looks bad. But each component only only communicates with the parent component, so you, you have a simple interface from the from each component. Um, but you can have multiple file system servers, which would seem to make this really complicated. Um, but when we run Unix programs in our Unix emulator, we have this nukes process. This is a confusing name, um, but. Uh, <coughs> And so Nukes sort of acts as the kernel, um, and there's this VFS, virtual file system layer, in the Nukes uh, runtime, which is just like the kernel. Um, and we broke the VFS lib. We, we broke the VFS layer into a library, so you can use the VFS to communicate over an FS session um, with a block server, uh, and you could. I don't have the MP implemented yet, 9P implemented yet, but you can go over network. Um, so where do you put NICs? Uh, so when you configure a VFS, um, either in the, the Nukes runtime or in a program that has the VFS library linked in, up here you see VFS root label. That is a connection to a file system server. And the root argument says change root as soon as I connect. And the label is provided as a um, for the parent to decide where to route which file system server you're running. And so I have nukes package written up here because these two these two top connections, presumably I want them to go to the same place. But uh, my, for my home directory, I want that to be a different server. Um, <clears throat> so the trick is if you can rewrite these arguments at the parent. So up above, say we have this VFS configuration. I don't send the session request to a, to a file system server. I send it to this Nix server. And so whenever this sees nukes package, it looks in this file nukes package slash default.nix, which can be a really simple function that takes the root argument. And so here I'm just taking this root argument out of a set, which presumably I'm rewriting the root argument to be a, 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 a store root. And you can see here the store root doesn't have a leading slash on it, which is, it seems odd. Um, but then once, once I have a connection vicariously through the Nix server, I'm just gonna pass a capability back up, and then I have a direct connection, but I have a true root. So I've rewritten the, 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 uh, <coughs> the true root um, using this, and so, what you can do is you can have the VFS in a server that serves FS sessions, and then you just make one evaluation of the VFS server, and then all clients would use that, that Nix evaluation. Um, and I'd like to talk about how it works underneath, but I don't have time for that. Um, so I can give you a sh quick demo. Um, this is, well, maybe I won't show you that. But to, just to, for, for brevity, um, Okay. So I'll start bash in the, uh, the runtime, and you can see up here, I'm not building the packages because I don't have all the expressions ready for that. 
but I'm using connections to a next door. And so, well, there's probably a lot of garbage in here, but like I have this, I have, um, I can look inside and see I have some store paths, but um, I mean, bash, bash is not a sim link. Bash is a real, is a real file. Um, <clears throat> and this this launcher I have isn't doesn't have any sort of Nix support built into it. This is just a okay. Um, I've just sort of done this FS stuff. And so I have a really stupid example here that I came up with. So, um, all right, so I have this folder, Nix. So what happens if I, I, there's nothing here. But if I try and run a non-existent, uh, script generating foobar.sh oh. no. that's the wrong uh, extension okay yeah you're using dosbox but you can generate files to nix and so over here you can see um, I don't know why it, it requests the file over and over I don't know that much about dos but if I have if I have libc, I can sort of access Nix solely using the file system by abstracting different parts of the file system. And there's a lot of other details I could go into, but I don't think I have time. But yeah, that's it. Uh, we got time for one question. When should we expect like a full-blown talk? Because that's pretty interesting. Um, I was afraid the wheels would fall off, so I didn't want to request a time slot, um, a full slot. But um, again, I need to sort of clean things up and get things uh, finalized. But yeah. Yeah. Hello, it's loading. Is my time already like counting? Because I thought that I have a laptop and right. I mean, I'm I'm booting Manjaro Linux. Throw tomatoes at me. It's like this not NixOS thing. I have an excuse though. Like I I I have to build stuff for Arch Linux, so. This is sort of my development machine, so then. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody know how to use XRender? <laughs> yeah, me too. Ah, uh, oh, shit. Just do X render. Yeah, right, right. So it will say, okay, it didn't detect anything. Why? Right. Because the other things connected to the second. Plug it. Okay.
Ah, yep. And yet right. now minus minus auto. I know. So output. What? What mirror? I want. I wanted. I wanted to mirror. Okay, amazing. Yeah, but uh, uh, let me let. I didn't even take time to change the desktop background. That's, that's how little I care. Okay, let's just now wait for Chromium to boot up. Oh, cool. <coughs> yeah, right. There's that thing. Are you alright with it being cut off? Oh uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh sh no, that's the wrong one. Oops, oops, oops. You, you, you didn't say anything. <laughs> cool. Won't go full screen. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah, that's 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 a nice idea. Yeah. Just move the terminal hmm? Now it looks like it's okay. Yeah, I mean it doesn't have text. So. Oh, how did how did that happen? <coughs> anyway, I opened the terminal and then everything worked. <coughs> cool. So start the timer. Uh, the topic of the topic of this talk is quest for distributed Hydra and you might wonder like what what do I even mean with with distributed Hydra we already have build farms right so uh, in companies we build a lot of stuff and uh, you know we sometimes want to add some servers to our build cluster through Amazon EC for instance and not do any configuration just you know just have a build cluster like in Erlang and forget about it um, also, in ideal world, we would love uh, for you know people in Nix community to be able to contribute their computation power to actually uh, you know offload the load from the main Hydra instance to build binary caches for the people. And and here is the pro problem of trust, right? So we want so we we have two goals with this quest we're on. First goal is zero configuration Hydra clusters. And the second goal is zero trust Hydra clusters. Okay, um, so we 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 do not want to you know go full on and redo Hydra or something. We want to take uh, things very slow, one step at a time, and begin with figuring out how to actually um, use you know distributed build.pl script, I think it's called, uh, to 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 implement some. Strategy of, you know, distributing the builds because uh, some some strategy of distributing the builds other, other than fanning out the tasks with really smart locking, right? The, the, basically, now we're as far as I understand, we're fanning out the tasks, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the the machines that are in our Nix dot uh, build machines, and be and being really careful about how we lock stuff. <clears throat> so. Uh, what we want to do to begin with is to, do, to use consistent hashing to say, okay, like we have this set of, like in our company, we have this set of packages we're building and uh, we will build, you know, that packages on this, like we will hash 
package packages, and we will figure out that at this state of cluster, these machines are building that packages. This way, all our clients that want uh, to get binary, uh, you know, binary uh, outputs will know from you know cons from consistent hashing algorithm from where they should obtain the binary uh, the binary caches, and <clears throat> of course we we have no idea how to solve the the trust problem. So this is why uh, my colleague has, has, has chosen this as his uh, master's thesis. So if you have, if you have any like guidance and zero trust system, systems, then and if, if you want to join us on this quest, then you should drop us a line. That's about it. OK, thank you. Okay, I'm sure there must be questions about this. So. Oh, so you you actually talked about two things. So uh, distributed Hydra, and then you were mentioning the binary caches, which is about the storage. Of the yes, yes. Uh, I, I maybe wasn't clear about it. So basically, we want to experiment first with you know distributed build PL script. So to, so to integrate a consistent hashing there, right, and see how it plays with the entire process of of, of building stuff using uh, the feature of Nix, which uh, which is called distributed builds, and then sort of taking it from there with the with the experience we got and like with the pitfalls we fell into, do the proper thing with Hydra. That, that's our vision of how, how we should do that. And we, like, by the way, we don't have like any prototypes. I can't show any demos. It's just, it's just that we think that eventually, I mean, for, for the community, I mean, for companies, we can write workarounds and whatever. But for community, it's extremely important to figure out this trust thing, right? So that I can, that, so that I can in like one click, donate my computational power to the community so that you know we can uh, we can build packages we, we, we can build binaries for the people that's that's our like end goal I'm going to do another question but maybe you can already allow Jack oh, to sure. set up the next yeah. slides Pete has a question um, <clears throat> I guess I'm curious about what you really mean by zero trust so because uh, there are different levels of trust, right? You can say, I have public keys of people I know configured and then I trust those. Or you have this web of trust kind of thing. You have this, well, I'm not, not quite sure how to interpret this yeah, zero I mean, trust requirement. The, th the thing is that we don't have uh, you know, any vision of how it should be done. But uh, we have some ideas. For instance, we can implement something like notary systems uh, when the, in, in, in our cluster, and this is where consistent hashing, and if you have noticed, like this is basically a slide from Basho guys, right? So, so we, have, we have more than one server building the same thing, and then notaries are saying, what is your output? What is your output? What is your if if there is a consensus of outputs, then we sort of trust it. And of course, we have to make sure that in our hashing function, somehow we know that these three you know servers are are owned by different parties, right? That are not that, that, that they don't have a conspiracy. So this is this is sort of like what we're thinking about when we when we're talking about zero trust uh, hydro farms. Um, some hints you might want into spoofing and Sybil attacks. I'm sorry? Sybil attacks, S-Y-B-I-L attacks and spoofing. Okay, oh, what, what, do, what, what, do, what, what do we spoof? Um, hmm? Like, uh, what is the, 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 um, the threat because model? You may, because you said uh, you, you have to make sure that there are, there's not an alliance because um, spoofing is, is essentially... Um, when when uh, more than one agent collaborates on 
um, abusing the system, the trust system. So just some just some hints where you might want to look, which which keywords you might yeah, really I mean, want to look. We, we can talk about it, but I'm, I mean, I'm too stupid to see to see how it's immediately relevant. Like if we have good enough notary system, then we, we just pick like random notary. Or, or I'm sorry, uh, we pick notaries with trust, I guess. And I mean, we'll talk about it later. I, I'm I'm too stupid to, to to answer that or think about it right now. Anything else? Cool, thank you. So the next uh, presentation will be by Jack Cummings, who will be talking about Hydra in more practical terms, I would say. I think so. I All right. Um, I wrote this five slides during one of the presentations this morning. Um, someone was I uh, was noting that Hydra is a very very useful tool if you're doing internal Nix deployments, and um, it's actually kind of a bit of a work to get going. Um, this is my experience of setting up Hydra. So things have probably changed since then. I think I tried repeating this uh, with the latest pull of Hydra and uh, it didn't merge well with some changes I'd made. One of the problems I have is my builds can take hundreds of hours. So it's really annoying when a build takes 99 hours and the, the timeout is 100 hours, that you lo lose 101 hours of the work. Um, my Hydra server doesn't run on Nixos, it runs on a SUSE server. Um, it's the Nix I'm using is a multi-user Nix installed that doesn't use uh, Nix store as a Nix path. Um, and it's all internal to the company I work for. So um, this is kind of a one of the less traveled paths in Nix, I think. So the first thing you need to do is you need to grab Hydra. Um, that's the canonical way to get it. Um, then you build Hydra. Um, it actually uses Nix to build Hydra. Um, one of the less known facts is you can actually use Nix as a replacement for make um, and more. Um, you also need Postgres. Um, there was a time that Hydra worked with SQLite, but it does not work so anymore. That one took me about two hours to figure out. Um, then you make your Hydra database, um, create a user for it, pick a password, throw it into PG Pass uh, so that uh, I see tech ate my tilde. But um, then you can uh, use local authentication. Uh, standard disclaimer when you're using either of these things, if you start up a Postgres server on the big bad internet, it might actually only, yeah, who knows what that happens. Um, so the next step is run Hydra in it, and that sets up all of the, uh, the loads the schema into the database, um, sets up, I don't know, a, a few other things that Hydra needs to get going. And this is all stuff you run once the first time you set up Hydra. And then every time you run Hydra, I have just a little script to do this. Um, I do need to wrap in this in a script because I have a different store and state directory. So a lot of the Nix stuff has Nix store hard-coded into it, which I, I tend to discover on a regular basis. Um, then once you've got uh, the variable setup, um, there are four parts that you need to run currently. There's the Postgres server, which can, contains all of the state, state about all of the builds and all the evaluations. Um, the queue runner, which dispatches everything. The evaluator, which uh, periodically evaluates all of the uh, um, expressions you tell you configure uh, Hydra to deal with. And then a server, which is actually the web front end. Um, once again, uh, I've never had an internet-facing Hydra server, so who, who knows what kind of happens to it when you put it in the internet. So um, then, as far as this goes, uh, I believe the default is port 3000. I'm not sure. I, that may have been something I configured somewhere. I can't remember. Um, this is actually the easy part. Once you've The hard part I had with Hydra was um, getting all the dependencies and get it running. And once it's running, the web interface is actually really uh, easy to use. Um, 
just sending up inputs to a job set and uh, pointing it at the derivation you want to run. Um, it is worth noting it's worth backing up the Hydra database quite often because uh, in the application we use it for, which I'll talk a bit more about tomorrow, um, I tend to use it for doing the reverse mapping of what derivations mapped back to what source sources, which is something that uh, if I kind of miss a bit about Nix is being able to say, oh, I have this derivation in the star now. How did I build that? Or what did I? What sources did I build that from? So um, yeah, that was kind of a quick uh, world round tour of the guts of setting up uh, Hydra. Yeah. All right. Um, could you tell a bit more about that reverse mapping? That sounds. How do you actually do that? Sounds interesting. Okay, so uh, I have Hydra set up to evaluate like every sixty seconds because I don't really mind burning up a bit of computer resources. So when Hydra evaluates um, a branch um, and one of the inputs changes, it'll reevaluate it. So what happens is in the input tab of Hydra, uh, uh, it'll keep track of what revisions it used from what uh, SCM repository is to build the derivation. So that, it, that turns to be one of the more, more useful features I use in Hydra, is being able to look at the big table of what job succeeded at what point, find the green check marks um, in the mess there, and find out what revisions that was, and be able to track backwards from the derivations, what changed in all the inputs. Um, this is, since I find it very useful because my jobs can sometimes take, take hundreds of hours, so you have 10 or 15 in the pipeline. And the, figuring out when stage 13 of the pipeline failed, what version that mapped back to, and be able to figure out what you changed to, to break everything. So that's how I use that. Okay, so the final talk for today um, will be by Bob Long, as you can already see on the slide, and it's going to be about the Haskell web framework, as far as I know. Yep. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Bob, I'm from Dublin, Ireland, um, I'm over in Berlin for the week or so. Um, I just wanted to quickly talk about something that we've built at work using Usode, and we're building it with Nix and deploying it with Nix. Um, so I work at Intercom. Uh, what we do, our kind of mission is to try and make web and mobile uh, business a little bit more, the communications involved a little bit more personal. So if you've ever had a bad experience with a help desk, which I tend to do multiple times a week, we're trying to kind of solve that problem. So we build a couple of products around customer communication, but we also have a fairly good API and webhooks offering so you can build your own kind of software to do some of this stuff. Um, one of those kind of things that we offer are webhooks. So when we built webhooks first, we thought this was a cool feature. And then a couple of months later, we realized that people were building real businesses on it. And uh, we were not giving it the respect that it deserved. You, we, we obviously tested and monitored every single part of our webhook delivery pipeline, but what we weren't doing was, in an end-to-end -end way, doing some sort of continuous quality assurance, which is difficult to do. Because if you think about what, what webhooks are, webhooks are something that are fired sometimes seconds or more after they are triggered. There, there's no request response model, so this isn't like a typical web development testing task. There's, a, there's an asynchronous nature there. The other problem is that often you're investigating or want to investigate an issue on a production system, but you're on your laptop on the bus or something. 
But in order to receive webhooks, you need to have a web server running. And if it's on a, if you're subscribing to a public uh, production system, then you need a public IP or DNS to to subscribe to. So we've been working on this tool called Shellduck. It's called Shellduck because the team I'm on in Intercom names all of our products after birds, and we've been doing a lot of products. So now the birds are getting weird, but we're on Shellduck right now. Um, and this lets you write simple API request webhook expectations, and then Shellduck just does all of the machinery behind it. Um, so this is what it looks like. Each of these blocks is an event that uh, Shellduck has observed related to the webhooks pipeline. So if you're trying to investigate an issue, this is where we go now, and this, this tells us what's up. It's also got integrations with Slack. So it, if you configure Slack, it will send uh, notifications on test failures. And your colleagues will know you're writing Haskell because the F is in capital letters. Um, it's also got Keen.io support, so we do analytics based on failures. And it just sprays all of this stuff into these different services. So it's got a lot of concurrent components. It's got a test runner. A request engine is hitting the API. Uh, it runs a separate webhook web server to receive those webhooks. And then it runs an optional SSH tunnel so that you can test this on the bus. And it runs a Yasode web server, which you just saw. Uh, Yasode's cool. Um, if you like web development and you like Haskell and you like DSLs, that's the Venn diagram, then Yasode is for you. In Haskell, we have the notion of quasi quotes. Well, in, in GHC, we have the notion of quasi quotes where we can kind of embed these DSLs into Haskell. Yasode itself is kind of, I think they bill it as kind of a traditional MVC framework with Haskell's type system used to good effect. It, it rules out a lot of the types of errors that web programmers, web programmers are pretty used to. It's got a bit of a reputation of being difficult, which I think is slightly unfounded if you look at the core simple Yasode web app is about 20 lines to get a hello world thing going. But if, you're, if you want to do web development in Haskell, you should just pick a framework because if you don't like something, generally things compose pretty well, so you can just rip out parts and replace them with other parts. So it's not a big decision you have to make, which is nice. You can't do that with Rails and Sinatra. They don't compose at all. So uh, I feel a little bit embarrassed about this slide after listening to a day of cool stuff about Nix deployments. But I thought I was really smart using Nix copy closure to do this. But my needs are pretty simple. We just have a fixed uh, EC2 instance. And we use Nix copy closure to send this uh, closure over. Uh, I will probably be doing Nix ops soon as a result. Uh, Intercom is pretty crazy about deployments. If any of you have read any of our blog posts, we do like 100 deployments a day about without any downtime. And we've got a great ops team who care a lot about this stuff. One advantage of Nix copy closure is that it's so kind of small. It requires very little of an investment with a, uh, from your infrastructure team if you have one. So if you're looking for a way to kind of sneak Nix in initially, maybe this is a good approach as opposed to a full Nix ops thing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Sorry? Can we use your laptop? Sure. Okay, so we have uh, still like a couple of One Chrome or something? For questions. Yeah. Uh, so when you're doing these builds to do Nix copy closure, is mm -hmm. that do you have a pre-configured machine that knows about how to run Nix, or do you have all of your colleagues have, in, have them install Nix so they can do deployments? Yeah. So uh, the way we we do this is that we use uh, virtual machines to develop it, um, and it's like a vanilla Nix OS box that I think we install using Vagrant or something because that's what everyone uses in work. Um, so it's pretty easy to get up and running in about 20 minutes or so just by following a set list of commands, and then you can start deploying to our fixed instance. Okay, so you have multiple people doing that? Yeah, a couple. Okay. No. 
Uh, are you using a servant? Oh, no. No? No, we're not. We, we, so what's interesting about... Servant is uh, uh, kind of built as a very type-safe uh, DSL in Haskell for generating RESTful APIs, is that fair? Yeah. Um, yeah, just didn't pick it. But it does run, as I said, two web servers. One is in Yasode for the main UI, and then another one is just for receiving uh, webhooks. So maybe that would be a good good pick there, because we can swap that out pretty easily. 